Hello and welcome back to the Frogs of War podcast. I'm Anthony North. That's Russ Hodges. We're here to talk all things TCU Athletics today. And right now, the all things TCU Athletics is TCU Baseball on the way to Omaha. Uh, we're recording this Thursday night. So when you hear this, it'll be game day for the first game of the College World Series in Omaha, Nebraska, as TCU Horn Frogs advance out of the Fort Worth Super Regional past Indiana State and are on their way to to take on Oral Roberts in game one. Uh, before we get into recapping all of that and looking forward to the matchups and the brackets in the College World Series, Russ, how are you doing tonight? Excited to see the TCU fans putting up a, a good fight early on in the jello shot competition that's happening yes. out there at the at the bar in Omaha. Uh, LSU fans, unsurprisingly, uh, blowing everybody out of the water right now. I'd expect them to uh, to put in some serious work there in, in Omaha doing the jello shots. But um, hopefully everybody's out in Omaha supporting the Frogs. It's going to be really exciting to see the action. And, uh, you know, I, I pulled up the, the map from, from where I'm at here in, uh, in Rochelle to Omaha. Only a five-and-a-half-hour drive, man. Might, might oh, that's an easy stroll. Find a way to Got to get out Find there. a way to sneak out <laughs> there and, and might be able to catch a game. But. Uh, excited to watch it tomorrow and hoping to hoping to see some awesome stuff this weekend. Yeah, man, it's it's such a thrill and for the frogs to get back there for the the first time since 2017, but you know, it it feels like TCU uh it, it's kind of being back home, you know. You saw some of the some of the tweets from like Kirk Sarlus with his his family from the last time they were out there uh, as an assistant coach and now he's back as the head coach and you know, his kids are a little bit older. He's he's looking a little bit older, I guess. But, um, you know, I think TCU does feel like they've they've got a little bit of a home there in Omaha. And I think the fan support will, will definitely be there. That'll be super exciting. Where the fan support certainly was this past weekend in Fort Worth at Lupton Stadium, just an incredible atmosphere, incredible crowd uh, came out to support the Horn Frogs in the surprise Fort Worth regional or super regional over 8,000 fans each night for the two games of, of the super regional sweep. And the, the second game, the Saturday game that was rain delayed several hours and went late into the night had 8,994 fans, just shy of 9,000 TCU supporters out there. And just, an absolutely incredible crowd. I mean, that's the the top college baseball on campus attendance um, in the state of Texas. The top I saw Florida set a bunch of records. The Gators out at their um, super regional, and it was still several hundred less, fewer people out there than uh, than the Frogs had. So, I mean. I got to go out there for the Friday night or the Friday afternoon game uh, brought two of my kids and it was crazy. I mean, the, the amount of people, I saw some people kind of saying, Oh, you know, it's, it's not really built for this. There's too many people. It's too, I don't think so. I think it was a TCU administration and, and the facilities people there did an incredible job managing the crowd, um, having the facility set up. They had plenty of, you know, supplemental bathrooms available. They had plenty of water stations and the concessions people were incredible. They were kind of climbing over people, climbing over bushes and, uh, you know, selling beer and and waters and sodas and hot dogs and stuff out there in the, the general admission section. And um, I, it, it was just, it was perfect days and nights of baseball. And to see the Horn Frogs get those two victories and, get the get the frog pile celebration a little bit and um and secure that bid to uh to Omaha was just a sight to see. Yeah, the GA section in Lupton looked like it was about to bust open. I mean, you had fans all along the first base foul line, you had fans all in the in the right field part of the stadium and busy with the concessions. I think there was about $15,000 over that two game period raised for the Indiana special Olympics. If you recall last week um, with Indiana state, not being able to host, of course they were a top 16 national seed, not able to host because of a prior obligation with 
Indiana Special Olympics, um, people began to donate money, TCU fans, college baseball fans alike, to Indiana Special Olympics. And Jeremiah Donati came out and said that every dollar sold in concessions would equal a dollar to donate to Indiana Special Olympics. And uh, shout out to all the fans that that supported that cause. A lot of money raised for for a really good cause there. And as you said, back to back, I think it was 8,000, 8, a little over 8,800 for the first game, which was a record crowd. And you follow that up with a, another record crowd there and setting a record for the state of Texas. Florida, as you mentioned, that's a number two seed in this tournament with a great fan base, a great program that's successful year after year um, down in Gainesville. And TCU is able to, to, to top that attendance mark. So the fan support was unbelievable. And it was really a, a tremendous series. I really enjoyed it. It was very competitive. Give Indiana State a lot of credit. Indiana State came Absolutely. in uh, on, a, on a roll, much like TCU. And it, it was really just a couple of innings that got away from Indiana State over the weekend. I thought their, their two starting pitchers came out and threw really well, uh, made TCU pitchers uh, get deep into counts. Um, early in a couple of these games, they scored two runs in the first inning on Saturday. And we're working uh, heavy counts against Cole Klecker earlier in that Friday game. So Indiana State played a really good series of baseball all around, but TCU was just a little bit better. And this is the first super regional win for the program since 2017, first trip to the College World Series since 2017, and two two wins over uh, top 16 national seeds now in this in this tournament. TCU taking down Arkansas twice to win that regional and then taking down the number 14 team twice to advance the college world series. So just very, very impressive stuff. Um, first appearance in the college world series with Kirk Sarlus as the head coach. Of course, he's been there as an assistant coach already, but making his college world series debut as the head coach, I'm sure that's going to be a really exciting experience for him and his family. So um all around a, a really fun weekend of baseball, of course, as a, as a frog fan, really exciting to see how that unfolded. And again, the fan support was unbelievable for, for TCU fans. So shout out to everybody who attended and cheered on the frogs. I think that really did make a huge difference. All of the fan support getting behind the team. So um, everybody, a, a job well done for everybody all around, everybody involved in, in putting on the series at Lupton and, Ultimately, the Frogs able to come out and execute and move on. So uh, just really good stuff all around. Yeah, for sure. And and you, you really hit on it there with the uh, being impressed with this Indiana State team coming out. Um, out here, it's a tough situation to go play in front of that many fans on the road when, when you're the higher seed and you had kind of earned that at, at your home place. But they they were – very impressive. It, I mean, this we knew that this pitching staff had those statistics, and there was a lot of pushback when we kind of said, "Hey, these these pitchers are the real deal." You guys, you got to watch out. Um, don't don't take this lightly. And it's, ah, well, you know, they're doing it in some knockoff league, and we don't care about the Missouri Valley or whatever. And uh, they came out and very much proved themselves. I mean, um, the starter on Friday went deep into the game, had a bunch of strikeouts. Um, I, I think it's, I can, I still can't pronounce it. Jake, Jake, yeah. Um, and I thought, I thought it was going to be Fenlong starting that first game. And so he can, but Jake came out and, and really had a great game, but gave up a couple of home runs and that was it. I mean, you know, it, it that's all it took because on the other side, Cole Klecker, true freshman, put up an absolute gem out there. He did work into a little bit of trouble, maybe a little bit of nerves, a little bit of butterflies there early in the game. But, uh, you know, nine strikeouts over seven innings um, and uh, giving up no runs. The uh, The Sycamores don't score until a, a home run in the ninth inning. That's just uh, a solo shot that brings the final tally to a, a four to one, but Cole Klecker winning that pitcher's duel um, after, and really both of these games were pitcher's duels, but after the previous 
uh, at the regional in Fayetteville where TCU's offense was so explosive and, and scored so many runs uh, for the pitching staff to be the thing that really held it down in Lupton against, uh, against the Sycamores was it, it's always good to see a team come out and win in different ways to, to see that you're able to, to kind of come at these teams and, and take whatever whatever their best shot is. TCU is able to to deal with it. So um, I was I was very impressed with with what Indiana State did with Jakich and with Fen Long on on Saturday as well. Uh, but TCU just you know made those couple of plays to to be able to escape with it. Yeah, Jakich was right around a hundred pitches, I believe, in the Friday game, and then Fen Long he wound up at about 115 pitches or so. I mean, he went a lot deeper into that game than I thought he would. And both of those guys, you have to give them a lot of credit as well, because Jakic gives up three runs in that one inning. Uh, Fenlong gives up five runs when he has a two zero lead. And then Fontenelle hits a home run in the following inning, but he came right back and, and shut TCU down over the, over his last couple innings of work. So those two pitchers, we talked about it last week. Indiana State leaned very heavily on its three starters to go deep in the game. So it wasn't a huge surprise that Jakic, Jakic, I think, went eight innings. He did have three walks and, of course, gave up those three runs. But uh, primarily a sinker ball pitcher, that sinker was really effective throughout most of this game when he was able to get it uh, down around the belt, that lower third of the strike zone was where he was really effective with that pitch. It looked like you know, that, that pitch looked like it was just going right down the middle and TCU hitters just weren't able to barrel that ball up because it was diving at the last minute and, and getting into that lower pocket of the strike zone. So, you know, he goes eight innings and then Fenlong comes out. He's throwing mid-90s at the start of the game. Really good breaking stuff as well. Um, again, almost almost 120 pitches from him in this game to to, to keep them around after those those rough frames. Those two guys deserve a lot of credit. But on the other hand, Cole Klecker, I know we talked specifically about him last week, and we talked about, you know, what can TCU sort of tweak going into this series because they have been playing so well. The offense is scoring so many runs. The pitchers are throwing well. The relievers are coming out of the bullpen and throwing well. TCU's being an aggressive on the basis. Like, what can they, what can they tweak? What's going to be a key going into this weekend? And specifically, we talked about, Cole Klecker needing to have a, a big start because you go back to his previous two outings, uh, both outings, he went four innings or fewer, had some issues giving up some home runs specifically in that game against Arizona, but he was dominant in this game. I mean, nine strikeouts for him. That was a season best seven innings. He throws 101 pitches, only gives up three hits, had really good command over the middle latter part of the game. Did have a little bit of uh trouble to navigate through early on I think he had a, a couple walks and as I mentioned at the top you know Indiana State was working some deep counts you know they were they were working seven eight nine pitch at bats and even even if they weren't able to get on base with those at bats if you can force a starting pitcher to go you know 15 20 25 pitches in one inning you're going to get them out of the game sooner rather than later and I think Klecker was at the 35 to 40 pitch mark after two innings. So they, they made him work early, but he was just so crisp with his command over the middle latter part of the games. And other than a little bit of hard contact in the seventh inning, when he was starting to, to, to taper off there at the 100 pitch mark, he had awesome stuff all game. So he deserves a heck of a lot of praise for his performance. And then, like you said, it was when you think about it as a whole, TCU scored 10 runs in this series. Eight of those runs were scored in two innings. So it was just a couple of big innings. In the Friday game, it was Austin Davis and Cole Fontenelle each hitting home runs uh, to spark a three run frame for TCU. That put the Frogs ahead three to zero. And from there, it was just the pitching. I mean, Klecker was dominant, Luke Savage came in. He threw the final two innings. I think TCU got a a run on a a sack fly or sack fly. RBI mm-hmm. ground. Okay, yeah, in the in the ninth inning, I believe. And then Luke Savage was able to to secure the win there. And then going into Saturday, um, Indiana State gets the jump on the Frogs. They score a couple of runs there in the first inning off Sam Staudenborough. But 
he continued to battle after that. And Stoneboro had another, he, he's been basically a quality outing every time he's gone out there over the last month of the season. And I don't think enough can be said about the way that he has stepped up for this team when some of the veteran pitchers that we had been counting on to, to be big time contributors earlier in the season, just weren't able to come through Sam Stoneboro earned his chance to move into the starting rotation and he threw five and a third in this game. Um, I think he, he, he got out in the sixth inning and it was six to two. I know a belt came in and didn't have his best command in this game, gave up a couple of runs. I believe one or two of them were charged to, to Stoneboro, but yep. Stoneboro had a really good outing and that's been basically what we've gotten from him over the last month is he's gone five or six innings held teams to only two or three runs. And the way that this offense has performed, that's put TCU in a position to win almost every time. And it, and it makes sense because he's five and zero oh on the season. When you look at his win loss record as a pitcher, so a really good outing for him. And then the, the big inning with um, just kind of death by a thousand cuts for, for Indiana state in, I believe it was the fourth inning where you have Trey mm-hmm. Richardson reaching on an infield single, a little chopper to the third base side, no play for, for Indiana State. They score one run. Anthony Silva comes up, pokes a, a, a single to right center. That brings in another run. Luke Boyers, who's been, been really scuffling lately, I think he was in like a two for 24 slump or something like that. Hits a double up the middle. That brings in another run. Curtis Byrne hits another little chopper to third base. And this is a play, I think, that it could have been ruled an infield single or a throwing error. They called it an error. But nevertheless, it brought another run home. Austin Davis, an RBI ground out. It was just, you know, nickel and diming Indiana State for five runs in that frame. And then Cole Fontenelle comes up. I I think the best hitter for TCU in this Super Regional was Cole Fontenelle. The way that he... For sure use the full area of the field, hitting from both sides of the plate, giving TCU a much-needed insurance run there with that solo home run in the fifth inning where he takes a a pitch low in the zone and gets it just over the fence. Huge shout-out to him. I want to say he hit 500 in in this series. I could be wrong about that, but he had a great series. Yeah, I think it ended up like 487. Yeah. and, And for him to be... You know, hitting out of that four hole right behind Braden Taylor. Braden Taylor was he was really quiet in this series, but to have a hitter like that come up right behind him, you you have to you have to pitch to Braden Taylor because if you intentionally walk him, you're pitching to a guy hitting right behind him who's hitting roughly three fifty, has I think thirteen home runs on the season. Cole Fontenelle is not an easy out either. So it's it's a really tough conundrum for an opposing pitching staff when you're in a tough situation and do we do we pitch to Braden Taylor who's got 23 home runs on the season or do we do we put him on and face a guy who is is hitting like one of the best hitters in this in this postseason right now so um ju- just a, a really good showing for for him and the the relievers who came in toward the end of this game Ben Abelt had he was kind of a he was kind of hit or miss in this game, but he's been so good over the last month or so. Uh, Sarlus let him stay in there, and he was able to get a couple of key outs, forced a double play to get out of a jam late in the game, and then had a key strikeout on a on a fastball on the inside part of the plate. Really impressed to see that. I think that was on a full count as well, and that was a huge strikeout for him. And then Garrett Wright coming out for the ninth inning. I was a little intrigued to see how he would perform because Garrett Wright really hasn't pitched much recently. I looked it up and his last outing was either May 28th or 29th against Oklahoma state. So this was his first time pitching in about two weeks. And he did give up a little bit of hard contact, give a base hit, a couple of uh, hard fly outs to the outfield, but you have a two run cushion. There's a little bit of room for error there. So uh, ultimately Elijah Nunez had, a couple of really nice plays in center field in this inning. He had a, a running play to get the first or second out. And then uh, ultimately I think a fly out ended it for TCU. So uh, fifth save of the season for Garrett Wright and just a really well executed series all around for TCU. No, no defensive mistakes that I can really think of except for maybe one play where I thought Luke Boyers might've had an opportunity to 
uh, run in and catch a ball on a, on a shallow line drive there. Might have been some sun. Not not exactly sure what happened on that play, but um, you know, other than that and, and a couple outs on the bases, this was about as well I think that TCU could have played as far as the pitching and, and the defense was concerned. So really, really encouraging stuff to see from TCU against a, a team that was coming in with 45 wins in Indiana State and a team that had been on a hot streak playing a lot of games on the road. So um, really, really happy to see the way TCU came out and, and defended the home field this weekend. And yeah, it, to be able to do it uh, like this with Braden Taylor, your best hitter and, you know, the, the superstar, the power of the offense to have zero hits in the super regional and TCU to come away with these victories. I think it's, it's a huge testament to um, the talent around Taylor and, and that really up and down this lineup is, is um, really dangerous. And, and to, to Taylor's credit, he did, I think have three walks on, on the weekend and, and scored a run. So he wasn't, uh, he wasn't a total, total loss, but uh, four strikeouts on the day or on the weekend and, and no hits. So when your best player is down and everybody else can, can pick them up. Um, that's a, that's a huge statement as well. Um, trying to think if there's anything else to, to point out, you did mention the, some of the base running. Um, I think there were, I don't know, two or three, maybe a little bit too aggressive on the base paths, uh, through the super regional. Um, had one get get sniped at home. I, I think early in the game on Friday, um, I don't know if it was Boyers or Bowen. Somebody was uh, somebody was heading home around it, it from first. Curtis, it might have been Curtis was it Burn because I think he he singled because he had a couple of singles in the Friday game, and I think he singled and Silva hit a double. They tried to send Burn and get him to score from first base, and he was thrown out at home. And he he was thrown out at home by like I don't know five yards. He was he was out by quite a ways, and that one wasn't close. Um, a couple of times tried to go running on that catcher, and it it turned out all of the all of the things you had read and and seen about um, the catcher McGill was indeed true. He's he was quite something behind the plate, and I think he he had a really good series and was able to help contain i mean tcu one of the most active on the base paths teams in the whole country and and really didn't get that piece of their their game going in any way at all so um you know a couple of things that you hope to see those improved in omaha and maybe get back to some of the things that tcu does super well but um tcu was able to to come away with these two wins without doing those things. So yeah, big kudos to, to TCU baseball. And um, did you have anything else on the super regional before we move to, to an Omaha bracket preview? No, I think we, we pretty much covered everything. Um, you know, again, Cole Fontenelle had a tremendous series and we know Brayden Taylor is going to pick it back up with, with Omaha coming up. And in his first appearance in Omaha as a TCU baseball player, I think that's, uh, going to be a, a really cool experience for him. We we talked about him, I think, a few weeks ago as one of the best TCU baseball players that has ever come through the program, and he's going to get an opportunity now to play on the biggest stage of college baseball and showcase his full talents. So uh, really excited to see what he can do this weekend. And uh, it starts with Oral Roberts, so let's go ahead and get right into it there. All right. Yes, let's jump into it. So Oral Roberts advances out of the Eugene Super Regional after losing the first game out there in Oregon in kind of heartbreaking fashion. They get I think they get walked off in the first game. They had a chance to to beat Oregon there and but they end up taking the second game in a walk off um to set up a, a key third game, a decisive third game and end up coming away with the win over Oregon to to advance to Omaha as a four seed, of a regional four seed, 
not uh, not the overall four seed, a regional four seed. It's only the third time that um, in in this structure of the College World Series NCAA tournament that a four seed has made it all the way to this Elite Eight Omaha period of the bracket. So um, pretty exciting to see that. I think, um, you know, again, TCU sets up against a team from a, uh, you know, a, a lesser considered conference uh, that maybe people have been sleeping on through this season and and would again have to caution TCU fans and people kind of talking about this that Oral Roberts is, is again, not a team to sleep on. This is a, a strong program. Oral Roberts has been around as a, a good baseball player program for quite some time i mean they i think they eliminated tcu from a regional a few years ago um but they've tend to make the tournament and tend to make some noise so um certainly i'm sure that their their fan base and that program is excited to be making this trip to omaha and uh taking on the horn frogs i mean yeah for th for them to come out of out of the Stillwater regional where they just swept through everybody somehow poor, you know, the Cowboys had a rough time. Um, but, and, and then go into Eugene and, and take down the ducks. This team has lost like once in the last month. We think, uh, we think TCU's on a hot streak. Indiana state was on a hot streak. And I guess everybody that's, that's here in Omaha is on a hot streak, but, um, Oral Roberts, really the only that one loss in Eugene uh, to open the Super Regional is is all they've dropped for the last month plus. So just a, another really impressive program to, to come out of the Summit League and reach Omaha. And TCU has already announced that Cole Klecker um, will be the, the opening day pitcher. Uh, TCU is the first game early on Friday, Friday 1 p.m. on ESPN and ESPN Plus. So, uh, you know, again, if you have to tell your boss that that you've got a meeting, you know, you might have to uh, find a, a spot to to catch the frogs as they take an, an afternoon contest in Omaha. Yeah, Oral Roberts did not lose a game in the entire month of May, and TCU. 19 and 2 over the last 21 games. Frogs are on a heater right now. Oral Roberts is 23 and 1 over its last 24 games and this team has not played a home game since May 18th. So this team hmm. I think closed out the uh regular season with a series against Western Illinois, took all three of them and then had the uh a couple games in the Summit League Championship, won that, went to Stillwater for the regional as a four seed took down Oklahoma State in the very first game of that regional, also had a regular season win over Oklahoma State. I can't remember if that was late April or early May. Um, and then going to Eugene, and sc they scored eight runs, I believe, in the third inning of that first game and were up 8-0, to zero, and then Oregon somehow was able to come all the way back and, and win that one 9-8. to eight. So that's the only loss for Oral Roberts over the last 24 games. And... Um, this team is battle tested. I mean, two wins over an Oklahoma State team that was a top 16 national seed at the end of the day, going on the road and knocking off Oregon and Eugene, winning a regional in Stillwater. This team has beated. This team has beaten opponents in the Summit League handily. When you look at the results, a lot of lopsided games there. But this team also has wins over really good opponents. Dallas Baptist was also in that Stillwater regional and Oral Roberts beat Dallas Baptist by one run there and also Washington, the Washington Huskies. So um, 51 and 12 on the season. This is the, the team with the most wins on this side of the bracket. You have Florida and Virginia with 50, TCU with 42 and Oral Roberts with 51. So uh, anytime a team can string together that amount of wins over that stretch they've they've done it in different ways they've done it with their offense they've done it with good pitching so this is not going to be an easy task for tcu whatsoever and i think the way that this tournament is going to play out for for those who don't know it's really like a, a regional and a super regional combined into one tournament now you have, you have eight teams 
you have the TCU side of the bracket, which is, of course, the, the number two, number seven matchup between Florida and Virginia at the top, and then uh, Oral Roberts and TCU at the bottom. To be 2-0 and at the start of this tournament is going to put you in a huge position to potentially be a finalist and make that three-game championship series. Whereas if you lose in the opening round, you would have to win two games on the loser's end of the bracket just to be in a position where you have to win two more games after that to get mm-hmm. to the finals. And so you're looking at potentially seven or even eight baseball games at the College World Series if you lose in the opening round. And does TCU have enough pitching to play seven or eight high-level baseball games? I, I, I don't think so, to, to be honest. I think TCU has enough pitching to get through hopefully four or five games, and I may be wrong about that, um, depending on how deep TCU can maybe go in this tournament. Maybe you're able to throw – Cole Klecker a second time, or maybe you can throw Sam oh, Stonborough sure. again. But um, being able to win the first two games puts you in a position where y- you make it to what's essentially the semifinals, and then you would have to be beaten twice. Um, and then on the other side of that coin, it's just you win one game and you're in the championship series. So th- these first couple games are going to be absolutely paramount for TCU to come out and just – really continue to do what it's been doing over the last several weeks. The offense has been coming through on a game to game basis. The pitching we've talked about it time and time again has been so much better. I guess if we can talk about, you know, some little tweaks again, like we did going into the super regional, uh, try to cut down on the base running mistakes a little bit. I think TCU likes to be aggressive. We know that they steal more bases than any team in, in college baseball. Uh, maybe taper it back just a smidge or or be a little bit more selective in terms of when you want to try and steal. Maybe, uh, maybe don't try to steal with Fontenelle or or some of your players that maybe don't have the kind of speed as uh, a Trey Richardson or an Austin Davis or or, uh, Elijah Nunez. So hopefully TCU can, can cut down on some of those base running outs a little bit. That's one little tweak. I think that would, that would really help. And then, Again, just if TCU can get another start from Cole Klecker like they got out of him at the Super Regional, and if Sam Staudenborough continues to pitch the way that he's pitched over the last month, TCU can beat anybody in, in this tournament. So um, I think when you look at this side of the bracket with Florida and Virginia at the top, and then you look at the other side, which is Wake, Wake Forest, who's the number one seed you have lsu in tennessee lsu of course super super talented stanford i believe is a, a top national seed as well yep. so um as as you mentioned i think tcu i feel like this is the best draw that tcu could have gotten as far as first round opponents in, in the college world series maybe maybe it's just me sleeping on the mid-major again but i feel like Virginia being a top eight national seed, Florida being the number two overall seed would be a a bit more daunting of a first round opponent than Oral Roberts. But uh, Oral Roberts is no slouch either. Again, 51 wins on the season, 23 and one over the last 24 games. This is going to be a really tough contest and seeing how some of the games played out uh, for TCU, you know, a three run win and a two run win over Indiana State, and then a couple of games in the Eugene Super Regional that were decided by only one run. And I think if Oregon had just a little more pitching, that third game might have been more competitive. I feel like the Ducks just straight up ran out of pitching by by the end of that series, and Oral Roberts was able to to kind of run away with it at the end there. But um, as usual, it's it's going to be all hands on deck for for TCU and. Um, some of the relievers that have been coming, coming in clutch over the last couple of weeks between Luke Savage and Ben Abelt and, and Garrett, right. They're going to continue to get work and continue to get put in some high leverage situations where they'll, they'll have to continue to, to do what they've been doing. So really excited to watch this game tomorrow and, and see how it unfolds. And hopefully, hopefully we'll see the frogs get into that second round there against either Florida or Virginia. Yeah, for sure. And I think you really are looking for Klecker to do 
basically exactly what he did against Indiana State. I mean, if he's able to eat seven innings, that that's absolutely huge. To be able to maybe save Benabelt, um, save one of uh, Wright or Savage, to to not have to go through three or four pitchers in this first game would be would be absolutely massive. So need need Cole Klecker to come out and have another big game like he's delivered for the Frogs this season. Um, and it's not going to be an easy task. I mean, this Oral Roberts team in particular has uh, has a guy who is currently on a 47 game hitting streak. Mm-hmm. Um, Jonah Cox is batting 420 on the season. He's the nation's leader in hits with 110 hits on the season. And he will be facing up with Cole Klecker trying to push his hitting streak to 48 games in Omaha. So uh, I, I think it's it's not going to be an easy task. They, they have – oh, there's – I need to pull up their roster. There's one other guy. I think it's Justin Quinn, um, who is kind of a masher, a uh, bunch of home runs. I hope that's the right one that I said there. Quinn, yeah, he's got seven home runs. Uh, Matt Hogan, 18 home runs on the season. So um, a lot, of, a lot of talent still in that lineup, and it'll it'll be a big challenge. And then their their starter that they're going to throw their ace uh that's going to be out there Friday afternoon is Jacob Hall and he's a big strikeout guy uh, very similar to Matt Jakic for Indiana State he's out there um you know 6 to 1 uh walk to or uh strikeout to walk ratio uh one of the top in the country so TCU is going to have its hands full uh, on Friday afternoon, and um, it it will in in either case, whomever you know, if TCU comes out with the win and and gets Florida or Virginia, or drops that first game and then has to survive against Florida or Virginia, it's going to be uh, a very intriguing weekend of baseball for for TCU. And like you said, very excited to see it play out. I think. Um, you know, Florida, Florida and Virginia both are coming into this probably feeling like they have a fast track to making the finals and, and getting, you know, maybe they hope that Wake Forest or LSU stumbles and, and they get a slightly easier match in that finals. And and they probably are looking at this as a that first game sets them up to go ahead and be in in the finals and think tc will have plenty to say about that though um i i would expect both of those teams to feel really confident um if whomever comes out of that that game friday night um will have a lot of momentum on their side and will have a lot of supporters uh behind them suggesting that that they are making their way into the finals and hopefully it's tcu matched up with them in in the winner's bracket and can maybe bring them down a peg there. Um, and, you know, TCU yeah. hasn't really played from behind all that much over the last few weeks when you look at how things have unfolded over the course of the Big 12 tournament, the regional, the super regional in, in Fort Worth. But you don't want to be behind against this Oral Roberts team uh, midway or late in the game because they have a left-hander. Uh, Jacob Widener is his name, and... He's been compared to a young Randy Johnson. He's got that tall left-hander, long hair. He's got that sidearm delivery, and the man throws 97 miles an hour, has some really uh, nasty stuff. Doesn't have the the same kind of like super sidearm delivery that a, a Josh Hader does, but he, he's a big, imposing pitcher that can really – uh, create problems for an opposing offense uh, midway or late in the game when Oral Roberts has the lead. So uh, it'll be a, a, a huge benefit for TCU if the Frogs can get out to an early lead like they've done over the last few weeks and and not have to deal with a, a pitcher like that and a pitcher that I'm not sure how, how many of those kinds of, of arms TCU has faced throughout the season. So uh, if they can avoid 
having to go up against that late in the game, that would be uh, that would be a plus to to not have to worry about him and, and make him be a non-factor in this matchup. Yeah, it's a really good point because they're the bullpen for the Golden Eagles is really strong and has uh, really strong metrics across the board. I mean, um, the guys with the most uh, appearances all have opponent batting averages in like the low 200s. Widener that you were talking about has an opponent batting average of 0.186. So yeah, uh, in, in 47 innings pitch. So a lot of these guys coming out of the pen are really shut down guys. So that's a, that's a really good point to watch of frogs need to need to start stacking up runs and, and get ahead early to uh, not have to try to climb out of a hole against some guys who can put up outs in a hurry. And, you know, with that, I mean, I think it, it's going to be a, College World Series is always uh, one of the most exciting sport events of the the calendar, and to have the the Horn Frogs in it this season, of course, is extra excitement for all of us. I think that it sets up for some great storylines, some great drama, and it'll be exciting to to watch it all play out. And um, you know, I think that that day, the Saturday games in particular are going to be just the the matchups between i really hope that we get a wake forest lsu matchup mm-hmm. at some oh, point yeah. in this in that side of the bracket um you know it's not it's not guaranteed to happen but um you know i think those even though those weren't like the two best seeds coming in, I think those are probably the the teams that are playing the best. I mean, LSU has the two top MLB prospects um, for the MLB draft, uh, a pitcher and an outfielder. And these guys, they can, they can all mash. Wake Forest is ridiculous hitting and pitching. I, I think there's a yeah, lot 20, of, st- 20 a lot of stars runs. here. 22 oh, yeah. runs in a game for, for Wake Forest <laughs> recently. That team can straight up mash the baseball. Yeah, the one guy had three homers in the game. Um, studs all around. So it'll be a fun time. It'll be fun to see who becomes the the household name, who who this this tournament turns into a star. And, you know, it's always fun to look back at these and see, you know, who goes on to to bigger things later on in, in a professional career. And, you know, TCU took on... Alex Bregman with LSU took on Dansby Swanson at Vanderbilt, the, uh, the UCLA pitchers, Trevor Bauer and um, Garrett Cole all went on to, to big major league baseball careers. So it, it's, it's fun to, to see these guys now in, in the college stages as they're, you know, a, a lot of these guys are most definitely going to be professional superstars in the future. So um enjoy them while they're in college baseball. And, and hopefully and we'll, we get a, hopefully we get a big frog fan contingency there. And oh, for sure. At, at the, at the Charles, Charles Schwab field, I think it's called now that that's the sponsor the the Charles Schwab field and in, in Omaha, hopefully see a lot of purple on the, on the television when we're watching this weekend. For sure. Everybody safe travels out there and uh, you know, take it easy on the jello shots. You know, you can, you can always buy the Jello shots and you know pass them around to friends just to to you know bump the numbers up. But you don't you don't you know it's it's a long. It, hopefully TCU is out there in Omaha for you know another week plus. So you know you can you can pace yourself. Let's let's make sure to bump keep those numbers up for TCU. But you know don't we want you to make it into the stadium and you know safely. Um, I think right yeah. now TCU is in. Uh, I think TCU is in second right now in that Jello shot challenge. At least we are not in a position like Stanford, who I think uh, had only three taken over uh, in that first day period. I think TCU had forty-seven for for second. LSU had like a hundred and twenty-five or something ridiculous like that. But th- those LSU fans, I'll tell you what. I know we talked about. Uh, some beach volleyball stuff earlier this season oh, yeah. when LSU came came they in and LSU as a top ranked. They their fans travel like crazy and they travel for 
everything. So you, you can expect that those LSU fans are going to be having a good time there in, in Omaha this weekend. And hopefully uh, us TCU fans can can try to match that energy. And then hopefully that'll be a, a good omen and a sign of things to come. For sure. We'll, we'll uh, keep you covered with everything at Frogs of War on, on Twitter. We'll be trying to keep up with the game. Unfortunately, I, I w- won't be able to be out there for it this for this one, but uh, we'll, we'll be keeping up with everything and keep all the coverage on frogsofwar.com and on Twitter, on Facebook. We appreciate all of you who follow us and who listen to this podcast. And um, thanks for all the support with that. We'll, we'll close it here and go frogs. Go Frogs.